blowout hit them in 10 threes. Bases are loaded for Verlander, who waits on a real finish. He swings, and it's a high fly ball, deep center field. It is gone. Home run. And a huge bat flip to celebrate. All right, Ben, start the show already. What is up, everybody? Welcome into episode two of Flippin' Bats. I am your host, Ben Verlander. Uh, what an opening weekend of baseball. I watched about 13 hours of baseball every day. It was truly incredible. It was perfect. It's exactly what I needed. I watched about six games at all times. It was, it was awesome. So I wanted to get right into some storylines that I took away um, from the first few games of baseball. First would be Shohei Otani. Now, this is in no particular order. Um, but these are just some five storylines that I did take away from so far. Shohei Otani, in my opinion, is the most exciting baseball player that we have seen in decades. Now, look, he's the reason I have him on my board up here. That's the reason. He's becoming so exciting. He's my favorite player to watch. Now, hear me out. A lot of you might say, the most exciting player we've seen in decades, we have not seen a baseball player like Shohei Otani. He throws over 100. He hits bombs. Look, in the first game, now he's the second, he's the first player in over 100 years to bat second in the lineup as a pitcher. We don't see that. Now let me tell you about what he did in the first inning of the game. He threw the hardest pitch of the year for a starting pitcher, 101.2 miles an hour, and he hit the hardest homer of the year at 115 miles an hour, all in the first inning of the game. Social media was going crazy. I was going crazy. I screamed in my apartment uh, without even, you know, with nobody there. Um, he's bouncing off the mound with adrenaline, with, with energy. I, I, I am in love with him as a player. He's my favorite player in the game. Definitely a storyline I wanted to talk about. Now, next, Cody Bellinger. Interesting situation came about uh, in their first game of the season. Cody Bellinger hit a home run, what we thought was a home run, to the opposite field, um, and he ended up passing. There was uh, Justin Turner on base. So they get into this whole thing. Now, what you can't do as a base runner, if you hit the ball, you cannot pass somebody else on base, or you are out. So this became a big topic of conversation. Cody Bellinger hits a home run. Uh, Tapia, the left fielder, goes up to rob it thinks he catches it, comes back down to throw it, and then realizes he actually didn't catch it, and it was a home run. But wait, wait, wait. Cody Bellinger passes Justin Turner on the bases, and it just became a, a whole thing. Now, what I started hearing a lot of was, oh, my God, Justin Turner, how do you make that mistake on the bases? Or, oh, Cody Bellinger living up to that meme. He just looks like he's, like, out of it on the, on the baseball field. No. No, no, no. This is not a problem on, on the player. None of them did anything wrong. Look, Justin Turner thought the ball was caught. His only thing to do is to run back so he doesn't get doubled off at first base. Cody Bellinger is trying to see if the ball he just hit is gone or not, is rounding the bases like normal. I've heard both of them give their explanation for this. Neither guy did anything wrong, in my opinion. Um, Justin Turner's running back to the base. Look, Tapia comes down with the ball like he's getting ready to throw it back. I don't know what Justin Turner's supposed to do other than run back to the base. What the big thing here is this rule. This rule has to change. When the ball goes over the fence, it's a home run. The ball's dead at that point. There's nothing you can do. It's in some fan's beer. He's throwing it back onto the field. The ball's dead. At that exact moment, it should be a home run. You know, I get this rule for a ball that stays in play. The batter runner cannot pass somebody else on base or they are out. But once the ball goes out of the, out of the stadium, come on, man. Like, that's a home run. And we got into a situation that really shows us why this rule uh, needs to be changed. Because this, was just, this is just unacceptable, in my opinion. The rule, the rule needs to change, and that should have been a home run. Uh, next, I would like to talk about the Kansas City Royals. In my season preview, I talked about the Royals and how they are my dark horse to kind of my, my bold, bold prediction of the year is that the Kansas City Royals are going to make the playoffs. Um, look, I, I, I kind of feel good about that. And now, now, don't get me wrong. They, they beat the Texas Rangers 
in a series. I'm, I'm not getting super excited over the Royals beating the Rangers in a series. But let me tell you what does excite me. All the runs they put up. And that is exactly what I said they would do. I said the Royals are going to put up runs in bunches. They're going to give up a lot of runs, but I think they're going to score more runs than most teams on most nights. They scored over 11 runs in their first two games, uh, just absolutely destroying the baseball. They, they scored, I, I forget what the final score was of the last game, but they're just putting up runs in bunches. And I feel even better about my prediction that the Kansas City Royals are going to sneak into the playoffs. It's a bold take. I get it. Very, very bold, but hey, I still like it. Uh, next would be the Philadelphia Phillies. Now, I have the Atlanta Braves winning the World Series this year. I'm very high on the Atlanta Braves, as I have talked about. The Atlanta Braves opened up this year against the Philadelphia Phillies, and they proceeded to get swept. Now, a lot of people could say, are the Braves even, maybe the Braves aren't that good. That is not true. The Braves are very good, and they have proved it for the last two years. They have an offense that's going to get even better. What happened? is they ran into the Philadelphia Phillies starting pitchers. And I never thought I'd be saying that. Look, Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler, Eflin, these guys came out and just dealt and shut down one of the best offenses in all of baseball. Nobody saw that coming. Uh, and you know what they did in the bullpen? They didn't give up a run. Their bullpen has not given up a run. So going into this, when I said, you know, I really, I, I like the Braves, the Mets are going to be good. The Phillies are going to have a great offense. I just don't know if the pitching is there. Man, if, if they can do this all year, watch out. NL East is going to have three teams at the top battling that out. So I really like what the Philadelphia Phillies did this year and, and, and have them on my radar now to watch out for in the NL East. And next, the fifth storyline that I took away was the uh, Red Sox. The Red Sox, man. I What... What was that? I, I came into this year a little higher than most on the Red Sox. I really liked the core that they have right in the middle of that lineup. I thought their lineup would be good. Uh, I thought their pitching could could get by. And then I'm like, well, they start the year against the Baltimore Orioles. I mean, it's going to be a 3-0 and start to the year, at least 2-1. and one. I, I, I missed that. I missed that bad. They, they looked awful. The Boston Red Sox looked awful absolutely terrible they couldn't hit they couldn't pitch and they got blown off the field in their home of Fenway Park by the Baltimore Orioles I mean just a an abysmal performance on opening weekend first time they've gotten swept at home on opening weekend in forever and it was by the at the hands of the Baltimore Orioles who let me say didn't look too bad they had guys that played really well and I wanted to use this to lead me into my interview. We have Trey Mancini joining us, who hit a homer in the opening weekend. And I am super excited to, to talk to him. What a, what a cool story uh, he is, uh, a comeback story. So I wanted to get into my interview with Trey Mancini. Let's welcome him in. Trey, what is up, my man? How are you? Ben, doing all right, man. Thanks for having me on. Of course, man. I'm rocking the, the Fight for Baltimore yeah, shirt. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, thank we'll you so much. Of course. We'll get it. I haven't seen that one. It's awesome. Yeah, this thing's sick. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But, dude, I am pumped to have you on. So, actually, you and I, our stories kind of started the same way. We got drafted the same year. We started in the uh, New York Penn League up in the, the yep, Northeast. Yep. And I was actually thinking about it today when I, when I was, you know, prepping for this. And we come out of college, you from Notre Dame, me from Old Dominion. And I'm, I have no idea what the pro experience is going to be like. And we get to the Penn League. My first locker room I ever went into was the Vermont Lake Monsters locker room. Did you ever play? <laughs> <laughs> Did Dude, you that, ever play yeah, field? worst locker room by far in professional baseball. I don't know if they have a team there still. Vermont was cool. Cool trip. The locker room was abysmal. It, I got to say it was like on on dirt. It was like a dirt track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it was like you're dirty getting out of the shower there. <laughs> I think that might be one place where we just showered at the hotel after the game. <laughs> so so you played in the, the minor leagues for four years. What is one memory that like sticks out to you the most that you'll, you'll carry with you forever? So most of the memories I have, I'd say almost didn't happen like between the lines on the baseball field. Um, there is specifically one time, there are a lot of different hotel experiences that you go through. 
And um, there is one when we played in Hagerstown um, in low A, my roommate, Austin wins. He's actually still a teammate of mine. Now he and I were roommates and we opened our little mini fridge in the room, which this hotel, I think was a converted in insane asylum. I heard. Um, and <laughs> like, and um, yeah, there were like 20 cockroaches in the fridge <laughs> and we just freaked out. It was disgusting. And then luckily they gave us another room, but um, it was kind of a haunted hotel. And that wasn't a good intro to it. <laughs> oh my god well i i'm like petrified of cockroaches i i, I could not have done it that's like you're yeah you're welcome yeah, to brutal. you're welcome to a professional baseball experience it's a <laughs> that was that's an exciting yes. one um speaking of the minor leagues a big prospect for you guys in the orioles organization adley rutschman obviously the the fans are pumped up about him do you have you have you played with him or in spring training like give us a little bit of info about him yeah, I've gotten to know Adley pretty well. Um, I first met him right after he got drafted in 2019. He came up to Baltimore and took BP with us. And I remember thinking, like, this dude, you know, looks like a big league hitter right now when he's taking BP. He looked like, you know, he could step on the field that night and, and perform. Um, and, and he's a stud. I mean, great catcher, great hitter. Um, he works extremely hard, um, really humble kid, you know. Um, and, and I think that he handles being, the number one overall pick really well he carries himself very well very professionally um and i'm really excited to have him up on the team whenever that is with you guys getting close is there any advice you've get do you feel almost like a like a mentor do you, are you giving him any advice or yeah i try to with all the guys um you know i want to be approachable and and i want the guys to come up and ask me anything um you know i was definitely a, a much later selection than adley so i don't know exactly what it's like to <laughs> Um, you know, carry the expectations that he does because, um, you know, realistically, somebody picked that high, you do have expectations that go with it. But like I said, he handles it so well. Um, and and a lot of the times, like during games, somebody like Adley or guys coming up from our, um, you know, alternate site here in the spring, they'll ask me about certain pitchers, um, things like that. And, and I always try to help them out. That's awesome. So, after the minor leagues, you get called up in September. September 20th, your second at bat, dude. Take me through, take me through that at bat. I can't imagine, like, so at this point, you're past, you're past where, where I have experienced. So you're in the big leagues, your second at bat in the big leagues, your first ever hit. Dude, that's so sick. Take me through that at bat. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, so my first at bat, I, I remember I just went up there. I ended up flying up to right. But even though I, I made contact, I was happy I didn't strike out my first step bat. That was almost a win. And I <laughs> before the game, I was like, I remember telling one of my teammates, like, I would do anything to just get a hit tonight. Um, and then, you know, flew out my first at bat, kind of got rid of the nerves and everything. Second at bat, Eduardo Rodriguez is who we faced that night. Um, and he hadn't given up a hit at that point. So I, was, I came up in the fifth inning. He threw me two nasty change-ups. That, that were outside corner faded away and I was early on both of them. And then, you know, part of me thought he'd go back to it. And then I, I also was thinking, you know, maybe he's going to try to blow a fastball inside here. So I kind of went with that um, and almost, I don't want to say I cheated to it a little bit, but I was definitely like ready for a fastball inside. And right when he released it, I knew that it was kind of where I wanted it and, and, um, you know, put the swing on it. And I barely even remember anything between that. And when I got back into the dugout, it was, Dude, it was just so surreal. I, I couldn't believe it. That is so awesome. And then there's a video that, that went viral of your parents just like jumping up and down in the stands. Like how, how cool, um, did that had to be one of the coolest parts of seeing your mom in the stands going absolutely crazy. Yeah, it was. That, I mean, that is, you know, years and years. I've been playing baseball since I was four. So it was just kind of like all the tough times that you go through everything. I, and, you know, you, you played baseball for a very long time, too. There's a lot of tough times that, that go along with it. And um, it all kind of got wrapped up into that one moment. So it was really cool um, that, that that could happen in my first game. Um, so you become an established big league vet, three years in the big leagues, and then it's time for spring training of 2000 or 2020 what is your mindset going into that spring training because it, it's now you're, you're you know you're established you're uh, you're becoming a vet on that team so it's got to be a little different going into that spring training uh from the mental side yeah yeah i mean everything was was looking and feeling great on the surface going into that spring training um you know i 
Um, I just entered arbitration. I, yeah, felt like I had really established myself. I was coming off a great year. So I was just really excited to get going and kind of build off my 2019 and, and um, also our team building off. We, we played pretty well in the second half. And um, I was just excited to get the group back together and, and keep improving. So by all accounts, everything was um, going great up until about, you know, early March of 2020. Yeah. So then comes March 6th, the day you're diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. What was that day? Like, where were you when you when you found out the news? Yeah, so it was it was an awful day. Um, I found out that my iron levels it came back low in our routine physical that we do every year. Um, and the the athletic trainers decided to follow up on that and get it checked out. And um, so they scheduled a colonoscopy for me, and we were expecting to find a stomach ulcer or celiac disease. And I went to the colonoscopy. Sarah had just landed. Uh, this was March sixth, like you said. So. Uh, she was working and wasn't able to come down for my actual birthday. So we were going to celebrate my birthday that weekend. So she had just landed right before I woke up from the procedure. And a nurse came out and, and got her and said, we need you to come in right now. We've been looking for you. Um, and then I woke up and Sarah was sitting right next to me. And then, um, yeah, the doctor told me he found a tumor in my colon. And he was 99% sure it was cancerous. So then... April 13th comes around and you start your, your chemotherapy. Where are you mentally during that? Or where, where were you then? Uh, so we went up to DC. Um, so right after I got diagnosed, I actually had a surgery March 12th, six days after my diagnosis to remove the tumor. And then we found out that, that um, a few lymph nodes tested positive for cancer cells. So when that happens, it's very, very strongly recommended you go through chemotherapy. And, and of course, we decided to do that. So uh, by April 13th, I was we were living in Washington, D.C., but I was getting my treatment up at Hopkins. So I would drive up uh, every other week to get my treatments up there. Wow. So what were you doing when once you started your chemo? Um, I'm sure it was awesome to have your girlfriend, Sarah, around. What else? Because you can't do anything physically really what what were you doing to to pass the time yeah and and uh, obviously the pandemic had just hit right around when i got diagnosed too so there really wasn't much to do at all um we'd go for like two or three hour walks um you know around the city on days i was feeling good on you know the day of my infusion and the few days after that i could barely really do anything or, or um, muster up much strength to to really you know walk around too much but by, by about Friday of every week, I'd get my infusions Monday. By about Friday, I'd feel pretty good. My appetite would come back. So we'd be able to walk around, play some tennis, like do some, you know, activity for the nine or 10 days that I'd be feeling kind of decent between my treatments. Well, I am, I am so pumped for you, man, and where you are now. And you see this shirt I'm, I'm rocking. This is all from your foundation, the, the Trey Mancini Foundation. Um, you know, cancer awareness, hunger. Um, take me through that. What are you trying to do with this foundation? Yes, yeah, so we kept it very broad. Um, our, our mission is just we want to help out anything that resonates with us. Obviously, colon cancer and, and cancer is near and dear to my heart now. But um, when we first envisioned making the foundation, my older sister, Katie, is the, um, you know, head of it. And, and she really um, leads it, I'd say. And then my younger sister is also on the board and Sarah helps us a ton too. So it's, it's the four of us that, um, you know, are really, um, working on it right now, but anything that resonates with us, we want to help out. So whether it's colon cancer, we've done, you know, a few events for that. Um, next we're going to be doing stuff with blessings in a backpack and the boys and girls club. Um, we're going to do an event with them, just anything that resonates, like I said. So we just want to help out, um, anybody that that needs it especially in the baltimore area dude that's awesome that's awesome so yeah, the comeback the comebacks the, i i'm so pumped for you and where you are the comeback story is just remarkable so tell me about the first day you got to pick up a bat again where the doctor's like all right trey today is the day or were you like in their ear like when can i do it when can i do it yeah. Yeah. So basically they said once I, you know, felt better after I recovered from my last treatment, I got my port taken out of my chest um, three days after my last 
confused. So after that, I was basically good to kind of at my own discretion, start doing some more physical activity and maybe gearing up for the next season. So I gave myself a few weeks of kind of slowly ramping up a little bit. And then I picked up a bat in like mid October and it was definitely the most excited I've been to you know, hit in a cage <laughs> in my life. I think I'm all about hitting on a field, seeing where the ball goes and um, just hitting off a tee in the cage was a huge deal to me that day. Cause there were times where I didn't know if I would be able to do that again. So I made sure not to take that for granted. And it was really fun. And, and, um, I felt a lot better than I thought I would too. I thought I'd be rusty. The bat did feel pretty heavy. I had to get used to that again, but um, it, it really was a good feeling to get back in there. The swing was still there, baby. It doesn't leave you. It's like riding a bike. Yeah, yeah. That's a, you never, you're never sure if it's going to be be there. You know, it was a long layoff. I had never had that much of a long layoff before, but luckily it was still, was still there. A man just hitting lasers to the back of the net his first day back. <laughs> So I follow you on I follow you on socials and and Sarah and both of you I think I, I've seen some videos of you with the virtual reality headset on. Um, does oh yeah. That, does that help you? Can you like actually track pitches legit or is it just kind of like a you know in between? Yeah, you can. It's awesome. So my friend my friend Adam Ravenel uh, he I works for I'm Win Reality. Oh you know oh yeah you know Rav yeah he was with the Tigers of course. Yeah. So Rav, Rav hooked me up. Um, yeah, he sent me the Oculus and the Win Reality, and it, it, it is awesome, especially um, just for timing, guys. If, if there's pictures you've never seen before, there's a silhouette of them on the mound, and it's their actual windup and everything like that. So even if you just want to know when to start your load and, and get started, it's great for that. Um, and it also has, uh, like, all their pitches on there, everything. It, it's a really cool app and, and a really cool tool to have that's sick so even if the even if the pitch isn't as realistic i mean you, you can't you can't imitate a hundred mile an hour fastball but what you can do yeah. is get a get your timing down from from any is any pitcher on there can you anybody yeah ju just about just about um and and yeah you really that's can sick. get your timing down um you know the, the other day i had faced i had never faced kenta my data um for the and I, I faced him for the first time, and uh, you know it was very much like it was in re win reality. I still struck out against him two times, but I at least had my Wait, timing. Your timing with that. was down. <laughs> 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 so that's sick. That could. Yeah, I mean, do, yeah. Do you the think timing was good. Do you think that's something you'll take with you into the season? Like you wake up one morning and you're saying, "Oh, okay, we're facing um, Max Scherzer. Let me let me put him in on the Oculus and and get my timing down." Yeah, I think so. And and at least just a few pitches. But at the same time, I also kind of go on memory and, and things like that. Um, I think the best experience at the major league level is just facing guys a lot. Being, you know, having a lot of at bats against guys really helps. And, and you kind of make mental notes of what they do well against you, how they attack you. And they do the same with you. So it's an everlasting chess match, I'd say. Yeah, and, and speaking of guys that you have faced, who would you say has who, – who's the nastiest pitcher you've faced? Like spin rate, like crazy, just curveball snapping off the table. Who's the nastiest? Your brother's probably got the best curveball that I've seen. <laughs> um, I, have a, I, have a, I have a pretty tough time against that one. Yeah. You got any, you got any knocks difficult. off of him? Um, there are so many, there are so many great pitchers in the league, but Scherzer um, is up there for me. I mean, he just, you know, you, you've got to be on your A game every pitch. And, and it's the same with a lot of other guys, but as a righty, it's a very uncomfortable at bat. So I've got to go with Scherzer. All right. So here with, with this podcast, we're all about having fun, flipping bats, swinging 3 0, all that good stuff. If you were commissioner, and there's, you know, there's all these unwritten rules of baseball that are so outdated and just make the game so outdated. If you're a commissioner for one day, what is one unwritten rule that you would be like, you know what, I'm, I'm getting rid of this. This is out of here. I think it's, it's the home runs. Uh, I know that's probably like an easy classic answer, but, you know, pimping the home runs, as we say, it's. It does make it a lot more fun and people get a lot more interested when they see personalities emerge when when you hit a no doubt home run. Um, last year when Tati swung 3-0 and hit a grand slam, I mean, what else was he supposed to do? You know, I mean, I, even if they're winning and, and things like that, I do think a lot of the rules are outdated. Um, I remember one time I was in the minor leagues and 
the same exact situation happened. We were losing by a lot. Um, somebody on Winston Salem hit a grand slam against us on a three Oh count and everybody kind of got mad. And then I was in the background thinking like, you know, he's trying to get up to double a we're competing here. Um, we're not trying to be nice to the other team. You got to put your best foot forward and, um, you know, don't get behind three Oh, if, if you don't want somebody to hit a home run off you. So, um, I'm all about swinging three Oh, um, you know, it's it's a dog eat dog world out there. So oh, I think, baby. I think you're gonna be a regular yeah. here, Trey. Let's go. It's yeah. all about it's all about putting food on the table, man. Like it's not about yeah. Hit, another... Hitting's hard enough. If you have the opportunity exactly. to swing three zero, even if you're winning, you got to do it. Exactly, man. Exactly, and it's all you know. Flipping bats. It's not about disrespecting the pitcher. I think for so long, that's what it that's what it was in people's minds. Is it, it's it's disrespectful to people and to the to the pitcher. And it's not. It's like if I'm playing wiffle ball in my backyard and I hit a ball 400 feet, I'm gonna be pumped. I'm not gonna try and piss yeah, off the pitcher, but I'm gonna flip the bat. Yeah, a lot of it's just adre- It's a way to kind of like unleash your adrenaline a little bit. Um, you know, a lot of times, like we'll hit a big home run in a big spot, like look in our dugout and yell and get pumped. I mean, that's just kind of what you do when you're excited. And it's the same with flipping your bat. It's just a lot of, uh, it's a way for guys to kind of, like I said, show their personality. And, and a lot of it's adrenaline too. Like you're so pumped and you just make it look cool. Exactly. Um, so you're an outfielder. I as well played outfield professionally. And I know firsthand that when we're out there, if I if I'm 0 for three with three Ks one day, I'm gonna hear shit from from fans in the outfield. I just know yeah. it. <laughs> what do you have any experiences out in the outfield from people like talking trash to you? Oh my gosh, um, yeah, there were a whole lot. I remember I was in Yankee Stadium. I forgot what year it was. It was 2017, 2018. But the entire bleachers, the entire outfield. Um, somebody had gone on my Instagram and like found my sisters on there and they were chanting their names for like an entire inning at me, um, the entire outfield. Like it wasn't just one little <laughs> section. It was like crazy. The whole stadium could hear it. And, um, but, but it, it makes it fun. I mean, I actually do really like whenever fans in the outfield are yelling at you and, and kind of engage with you out there. Cause I remember going to games as a kid, sitting in those seats and thinking it was pretty funny and entertaining to see the fans doing that to opposing players. So I'd be remiss to take offense or get mad if any, you know, fans of opposing teams are talking trash. That's, that's a part of the game too. It does. It makes it fun. And as long as you like own into it or don't like get all defensive about it, like by the, by the end of the series, they're all like on your side. Like you get a knock. Right. Come back right. Down, like, yeah. You. If, if you take offense and get like all butt hurt about it, then yeah, they're going to, um, they're going to wear you out, but you just kind of have to take it all with a grain of salt. Yep. All right, Trey. So I talked about this shirt before I let you go. Tell me where I can get some of these. Where can I get a, a, a fight 16 Trey Mancini shirt? Yeah, so on our foundation page, actually, um, I have the link in my Instagram bio. Um, but yeah, the, the Trey Mancini Foundation, we just released a t-shirt line with a, with a bunch of different shirts that people can buy to, to help support. That's sick, man. I love this thing. I am so pumped for you. This is a hell of a story, man. This is incredible. Thank you so, so much for joining me. I can't wait to keep seeing you rake. Keep on that Oculus. Get your timing down, baby. Let's go. Thanks for joining me, man. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right, man. See ya. All right. Just wanted to thank Trey for joining me. Also, these shirts, they're really sick. If you guys want to check them out, go to Trey Mancini Foundation on Instagram and he has a link there for the merch to donate anything you want. So, so go check it out, get you one of these shirts, help support a good cause. But now I wanted to get into one of my favorite parts of the show, the hotline that we got. So Rick, hit me with the first voicemail. Hey Ben, this is Dave. Uh, loving the show so far. Quick question, you know, what do you make of the altercation at home in the Cardinals Reds game where Castellano is kind of flexed in the pitcher space, you know, sliding into a close play on a pass ball at home. I know that there was a benches clearing altercation and, uh, you know, the home opener, there was uh, a home run and a bat flip, but just wanted to see what you thought about the whole situation and if you thought what he did at home was maybe a little uncalled for. Thanks. All right. First off, thank you for the question. I'm really glad 
that question got asked because I did want to talk about this situation. So for those of you that did not see what happened, the Cardinals and the Reds got into a brawl. Um, Nick Castellanos got hit by a pitch, 93-mile-an-hour fastball to the ribs, gets on first base, ends up getting around to third base. That same pitcher throws a wild pitch. It goes to the backstop. Castellanos runs home, dives into the plate, and is safe, stands up, and right in his face yells, let's effing go, and that proceeded to start this whole altercation. Yachty, Molina jumped in and started, you know, started firing back at Nick, and it ended up in this, this huge situation. I actually wanted to throw it to the Castellanos um, interview postgame real quick, so let's hear that. Uh, I dove. You know, uh, I felt him kind of land on my side and saw the umpire said safe. And then I stood up and said, let's go. And I walked off. I mean, look, yo, like I wore 93 in the ribs. That don't exactly feel good. You know, I asked Yachty if it was an accident. He said, of course, it's an accident. All right. Yachty's, dude, Yachty's a boss, yo. Like, all right, I give him the benefit of the doubt. You know, all right, it's an accident. Take my stuff off. I even asked the pitcher if he wanted the ball back. You know, just out of sometimes pitches, he's coasting. I don't know. There, I go to first. And the only thing I'm thinking about doing is scoring. I'm swinging it good right now. I feel good. There's two outs. There's nobody on. Hey, let's try to shake him up a little bit, get him off his game. I know how it works, man. You know, like it's baseball. Well, I'm not I'm not out here, you know, complaining about it. Now, the only thing I could do is just do everything I can to score. I'm not out here to disrespect nobody or whatever, but I want to win, you know. I've lost my whole career, and I ain't trying to start this season 0-2. All right. So here's what I will say. There are a lot of opinions one way or another on this. Who, who was it fault? Was it the pitcher? Was it Nick? Was it Yachty? Who was it? Well, here's my thing. Nick got hit with a 93-mile-an-hour fastball in the ribs. Was it intentional? Maybe, maybe not. My side of this is that it, I, I don't think it was intentional, okay? But what people lose in this whole thing is that you're still getting hit with a pitch in the ribs and 93 miles an hour, whether it was intentional or not, that sucks. And it really hurts. And you know what? Figure it out on the mound so that doesn't happen again. So Nick gets around to third base, comes in to score, and he's pissed off. He's emotional. He gets up, he yells in the pitcher's face, and then he walks off. Now, what I will say about that interview, he talks about picking the ball up and showing it to him, saying, hey, do you want this back? That, come on, like that wasn't like, you're not really trying to help the guy out. You're being belittling, which, you know, whatever. But I love this. I, I love it all around. I think stuff like this is great for, for the game. Raw emotion, raw energy, just having tension it's great stuff, and, and that's my biggest takeaway here is that, you know, I do not believe the pitcher hit him on purpose, but that doesn't matter, and everyone says, well, he reacted a certain way. Look, I, I get it. You got hit in the ribs. You're pissed off. You score. You're pumped up. Emotion. It's the opening series, so that is my fault. That is my thought here is that, you know, good, good for Nick showing some emotion. I'm all for it, so... Let's get to another voicemail. Hi, Ben. This is me, John. I just wanted to tell you that um, um, I'm a huge fan of the Detroit Tigers. I want to know, do you think there'll be a surprise team this year? You know, so just let me know. And um, I really would appreciate it. I'm a huge fan of you, and I'm a huge fan of the Detroit Tigers. So please let me know if there'll be a surprise team this year. Well, first off, thank you for the kind words. Much appreciated. My former organization, the Detroit Tigers, came out against the Indians. Looked great in the first two games. Lost the third one. Lost, uh, lost the last game. But they looked great, uh, which was kind of surprising. The Indians, I think, are going to compete in the Central, the AL Central. And the Tigers, you know, I, I, I don't think so much. I think it was really good to see. It was awesome to see Miguel Cabrera hit that homer on opening day and the snow. Really, really cool to see. Like, made for one of the best pictures I think we're going to get all year. Um, but I, I don't see them being a, a surprise team. They just they don't have the pieces that they need to right now. It's kind of a, 
ragtag bunch of you know veterans on one or two year deals and like young guys that aren't quite ready yet. I don't think they're going to compete in the central. Hey, I, I would love it. I, I think it would be really fun to see. But I, I don't see them uh, pulling out any sort of like, you know, like competing with the White Sox or the Twins. Those two teams are, are just elite this year. And the Tigers just don't have the, the firepower to compete with them right now. So let's get to the next one. So I'm just wondering <clears throat> what you think the Orioles are going to do this year. Just kind of curious what your perspective is. So, yeah, I think they're going to do this year. No playoffs. Last in the division, first, middle in division, or just straight up standing. So, yeah, let me know. Uh, my name is Paul Lee. <laughs> well, 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 first off, Paul, thank you. And thank you for not ending your voicemail before you got your name out. So, so thank you. Uh, so, you asked about the, the Baltimore Orioles, who we talked about earlier when I talked about the Red Sox opening series and how they just got pummeled by the Orioles. Look, the Orioles are no longer the worst team in baseball. They aren't. For, for so many, for the past few years, it has been a dark place for Orioles fans. They just haven't been good, and they also haven't had anything to look forward to. That's no longer the case. They are not the worst team in baseball, and they do have some exciting things to look forward to. They have Ryan Mountcastle, who's my pick for AL Rookie of the Year. They have Santander, who's in the outfield, who can really hit young guy. They have young guys all around. They have Adley Rutschman coming up, who is one of the most talked about prospects that I can remember in baseball. Now, that is something to look forward to. I do not think they are going to compete in the AL East. I don't think they're going to make the playoffs like you asked. I don't think they're going to come in first place like you said. I do think this is the, the last place team in the division when it's all said and done. Uh, you know, now they could be duking it out with the Red Sox, who, who may end up in last place after the way they looked. But look, opening series, they looked awesome. Matt Harvey, the resurgence of the Dark Knight? What? Um, that could be huge for them, and, and huge in more ways than just making this team good. This team has a, a young group of guys that is coming up, and if Matt Harvey, around the, the trade deadline, can continue to pitch like he did opening weekend, look, they could shop him around and get some more really good pieces uh, back for him and, and put themselves in an even better position in the future. So that would, would be my thing for the Orioles this year. I don't think they're going to be very good this year, but you can see it coming. So thank you guys so much for the voicemails. I love doing these. Please get your calls in. I envision this being like something really cool we do. I envision halfway through the year getting some calls of you guys just absolutely going off on your team and asking me what's wrong with them. So please give me a call at 213 213- Five three seven nine three three nine, and I will answer your questions on the show. So thank you guys that called. All right, so I'm not sure if you guys saw it, but Major League Baseball came out with their list of top jersey sales. So I wanted to get into that. I wanted to analyze these a little bit. We got the top five right here up on the board. We got Mookie Betts at one, Bellinger at two, Fernando Tatis at three, Bryce Harper at four, and Clayton Kershaw at five. So first thing that jumps out to me is all of the Dodgers. I mean... Good Lord, it's a lot of Dodgers. Um, a, a one that surprises me is, is Clayton Kershaw at five. Now, I think that just goes to show the popularity of the Dodgers, but it still surprises me. He's not a super exciting guy, I wouldn't say. I mean, he, he is Clayton Kershaw. He's one of the best to ever do it. So I get it from that standpoint. But the next pitcher, there's not another pitcher on this list until number 14, Garrett Cole of the New York Yankees. Now, Aaron Judge is at six. It got me thinking a little bit about the Yankees. Now, you would think Eric Cole would be a little higher. My thought behind all of this is, look, it's the New York Yankees. It's the pinstripes. They don't have their names on their jersey. I think that plays a big role into it is, is kind of the conclusion I came to. Look, you got Aaron Judge there at six, but he's number 99. Everybody knows 99. Everybody. Aaron Judge, 99, New York Yankees. You know that. But everybody else, you don't get their names on the jersey. So I really think that hinders some people from buying New York Yankee jerseys. And then we, you know, and then you see the, the Dodgers have three of the top five. Um, another one that surprised me a little further down the list is number nine. You have Kike Hernandez, now of the Red Sox, who is ahead of number 10, Mike Trout, the best player in the world. You know, a lot of people have been saying Mike Trout is, is the face of baseball. You know, he's the, he's the best player. He's the face of baseball. Well, we got Kike Hernandez on this list ahead of Mike Trout. I think that goes to show a little something. So 
That was a little surprising on the list. And that actually got us talking pre-show, me and my producer Davis, about the face of baseball, because that's been a big talk lately. That has been a big, you know, is, is Mike Trout the face of baseball? Or is Mookie Betts at number one the face of baseball? Well, I actually wanted to bring him on the show because our discussion, I loved it. It was a great discussion about who the face of baseball is. And basically, here's my argument. My argument is that there is no face of baseball right now. There's nobody. I think Fernando Tatis is emerging as such. I think that's a, a, I think, I think eventually we'll get there, but I don't think we have a face of baseball right now, unfortunately. And, and I wanted to, to bring in my, my producer Davis to get his thoughts on this. Well, first I agree with you that there is no face of baseball at the moment, but if we have to pick, it's not Tatis. It might be Tatis by the end of the year. It might be at the start, but clearly numbers don't lie. It's Mookie Betts. He's number one on Jersey sales for a reason. He has the East Coast media after winning a World Series in Boston. West Coast media after winning a World Series with the Dodgers. It's Mookie, man. It's clearly Mookie. Well, you are a Dodger fan. True. So your opinion is, is skewed a little bit. Here, look, here's my thoughts. Fernando Tatis is 22 years old, okay? He's young. He's already number three on this list. At a young age, look, Mookie has been in, in World Series and multiple and different sides of the country. I get what you're saying. I just, I don't think you can say right now he is the face of baseball. Fernando Tatis is the MLB The Show cover boy. He's the guy. They put the guy on the cover. So I, I don't think baseball right now has, has a face of baseball. But if we're going to have this argument, I think it will be Fernando Tatis. Will be, yeah, but at the moment, it's still Mookie. I know you say they're like, there isn't one, but I str feel strongly about Mookie because he's also signed to Jordan Britt. You know what I mean? So he's he's around. He's in commercials. He's flashy. He's diverse. And he's fun. A million followers on Instagram. A million look, followers. How many baseball players are actually over a million that are, on the, are active? Look, you want to bring up followers. Fernando Tatis is 22 years old. He has 800,000 followers already. He's already, he's going to pass, he's going to get to a million by the end of this year. You want to talk about diverse, he's bilingual. He appeals to both audiences. He just signed this mega deal, putting him on the map for the entire world. Look, I, I just think he's, he's going to be the guy. And I, I think he's already that guy more so than Mookie is. Look, I, I love Mookie. I think Mookie's an incredible player. I think he's the second best player in the league behind Trout. But I think his jersey sales are skewed because he's a Dodger, and the Dodgers are a super popular team. But look, the Padres are going to get there. The Padres are going to make the playoffs this year, and that's going to be the start of Fernando Tatis becoming the face of baseball, is my opinion, is when they get into the playoffs. And then my last argument, though, for Mookie is the fact that Mookie actually plays in October. I think that's what hurts Trout. Trout should be the face of baseball, but that second audience that doesn't watch regular season baseball has no idea who he is. Those people know who Mookie is because he's in it consistently and he's been in it consistently over the last three to four years. So that is my reasoning as to why Mookie is still the face of baseball. But if there's one thing to get out of this, if he's not the face of baseball, there's one thing that we do know, and that's the Dodgers are the face of baseball as a franchise and more than the Yankees. Okay. Okay. Get out of here. Look, <laughs> that... You make a good point about, about the playoffs. Unfortunately, Mike Trout just isn't that guy for multiple reasons. He's, he's not in the playoffs ever, unfortunately, and he just doesn't want to be that guy. He doesn't want to be that flashy guy. And, and we have guys coming up now that do promote themselves on social media and do you know certain things and, and, and flip bats and, and do all this exciting stuff, and, and that does matter. And I think he made a good point about the Dodgers being in the playoffs and, and being in the World Series, but the Padres are going to be there this year. The Padres are going to squeak into the playoffs. They're going to be a really good team, and Tatis is going to be on that biggest stage in the world come October. So I really do think that he is going to emerge and continue to emerge as the face of baseball. But I want to get into something else. We are going to start a segment on this show called The Six Tool Player of the Week. Now, I've talked about the six tool player before. It is something that I've kind of, I started. That's, you know, it, it's not really stat based. It's just a player that encompasses what this show is all about. Exciting, fun, electric, flips bats, 
strikeout struts around the mound when you punch somebody out. All of that, all of those cool things that just make baseball fun, entertaining to watch. So this week, the first six tool player of the week is Jazz Chisholm of the Miami Marlins. Look, Jazz Chisholm is so exciting to watch. Look at that picture. I mean, he's just, he's a stud. That's so cool. I wish I was that cool. I'm not. I wish I was, but I'm not. He was a big name to break camp with the team. He's been a huge prospect for them, and he won the second base job for the Miami Marlins, and that was a big deal. So it, it made a splash on social media, and then it came time for the first games. And look, I, I was watching the Marlins and, and Rays game, one, because of him, which should tell you something right there. He's just exciting to watch. He got on base via a walk, might I add. He flipped his bat, he was all pumped up, he gets on base, he steals second base without the pitcher even throwing home. Without even a throw home, he steals second base. He then, a couple pitches later, the next pitch steals third base, dives in, his helmet falls off, his electric blue hair is just out. It's awesome, it's sick. He's just laying in the dirt, barely made it in safe. He throws up the safe sign while his face is down in the dirt. The stadium's going nuts for the first time in Miami since, I don't know, Giancarlo Stanton hit a bomb there that went 600 feet. I don't know. And then he ends up scoring on a shallow fly ball to right field that nobody should be scoring on. He scored on it, dove into home, touched home, dove about 10, 15 feet past home plate. His helmet popped off again. His blue hair was everywhere. The stadium was going nuts. Um, it was really, really fun to watch and had a lot of people talking on social media. Uh, it's just what this game needs. It needs guys like this that can take pictures like that, just look sick, that are just fun to watch. The game of baseball needs guys like this, and I want to start showcasing some of these guys every week, uh, which is a big part of this show. And he, Jazz Chisholm, is the first one I wanted to showcase as my sixth tool player of the week. So thank you guys for joining me for episode two of Flippin' Bats. It has been a blast. I wanted to thank Trey Mancini for joining us. I'm really excited to watch him throughout this season. Really, really, really cool story. And I'm excited to have him on the show. I wanted to thank him. So thank you guys for watching. That is episode two, and we will see you next time on Flippin' Bats. Make sure you download and subscribe anywhere you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, wherever. This show is also available via video. So uh, subscribe on YouTube, follow on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all that good stuff. And we will see you next time for Flippin' Bats. It's a blowout, eighth inning, 10 3. Bases are loaded for Verlander, who waits out a real pitch. He swings and it's a high fly ball, deep center field. It is gone. Home run. And a huge bat flip to celebrate.